Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. And we start with question number one from David Stewart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment is made of the risks that it and its agencies face from cyber attack. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, the Scottish Government assesses the risks related to cyber attacks on a continuous basis and the controls that have been established to mitigate cyber risk are monitored by the Scottish Government's Audit and Assurance Committee. The Scottish Government works closely with the UK's National Cyber Security Centre to monitor and understand the risks of cyber attack and we will shortly publish a new cyber security strategy which will set out actions to ensure that our organisation is cyber aware, makes sound risk-based decisions about cyber security, is, dependent, is defended from the majority of cyber attacks and is resilient enough to be able to recover quickly from a successful attack. David Stewart. <coughs> Uh, presiding officer, Western governments and beyond are facing a digital battle of Britain. A series of brute force attacks, sometimes state-sponsored, have compromised hospitals, schools and critical infrastructure such as water and power. Will the Cabinet Secretary host an urgent meeting with the National Cyber Security Centre to review the Scottish Government's cyber security strategy? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I actually met the Chief Executive of the National Cyber Security Centre on the 5th of September and we had a very constructive discussion about the uh, work that is necessary between the Scottish Government, which in my earlier answer I said to which we are fully committed uh, with the National Cyber Security Centre to ensure that we take all possible practical and tangible steps to ensure that the government and our public authorities and agencies are protected in this way. I recognise entirely the significance and the seriousness of the issue that uh, Mr Stewart raises. I assure him of the government's determination to do all that we possibly can do to ensure preparedness in that respect. And uh, in, as part of that, uh, we will continue our discussions with the National Cyber Security Centre uh, to ensure that all lessons that we need to learn are learned and applied in practice. Finlay Carson. Thank you, President Officer. What steps has the Scottish Government taken to ensure that any new computer systems, specifically uh, that of the, the Scottish Social Security Agency, what security measures are in place to protect them from a cyber attack? Cabinet Secretary. Well, obviously, in the work that we undertake to um, ensure that we are cyber resilient, we have to in, uh, apply all of those lessons to the design of any systems or approaches that are taken forward. So the approach that the government takes is to, as I said in my earlier answer, ensure that we make sound risk-based decisions about cyber security, that we put in place the necessary defence mechanisms, and obviously in the social security system, we will be dealing with a very significant amount of personal information of individuals, and we have to make sure that that is properly protected by the steps that we take. And I assure Mr Carson and Parliament that that is at the heart of the preparations that the government is taking forward. Question number two, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to gain greater access to data held by HMRC that could assist in economic policy making. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, the Digital Economy Act will enable HMRC to more easily share data with other organisations, including the Scottish Government, than has previously been possible, subject to appropriate data security and other requirements being met. We are working very constructively with HMRC to make use of these new powers to improve our economic statistics and analysis. In addition, the Scottish Government are currently working with HMRC to agree a service level agreement that will ensure that they provide relevant and timely data to enable us to discharge our duties in respect of the Scottish income tax. Gillian Martin. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. In evidence to the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee, a number of witnesses has pointed out that the analysis of GDP on its own is a very blunt indicator of economic success and that more has to be done to quantify economic success in terms of inclusive growth. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what measures and data the Government intends to use to anal uh, analyse how well Scotland is doing in terms of inclusive growth? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, GDP, of course, is an important indicator of economic performance, but we've long recognised that it's not the only one, and that's why our national performance framework looks at a wider basket of indicators, including income inequality, reducing the gender pay gap, and reducing the share of employees earning less than the real living wage, all of which are important for inclusive growth. 
Delivering more inclusive growth is a central part of this Government's economic strategy, and we are currently refreshing the national outcomes, and these and the indicators underpinning them will be strongly influenced by the priorities articulated in our economic strategy. Dean Lockhart. Thank you. Last week, the Economy Committee also heard evidence that the Scottish Government already has a vast amount of data that could be used for a wide range of policy considerations, but the Government does not fully understand how to use this data. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore explain how the Government will improve its use of existing economic data which is available to it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would refute the underlying assumption that we don't know how to use the data, but I think there is, as the Economy Committee's deliberations showed, a real live debate about the nature of the data that we have and whether it can be improved. I think that's perfectly legitimate. It's something that this government is seized of. It's been mentioned by different parties in this chamber. It's been mentioned most recently to me by the SEDI, who also raised this with me last year. And I think the new analytical unit that will be established alongside the strategic board will enable us to make sure that we have the most effective use of the data, but also the right data to base our economic decisions upon. Question number three, Neil Findlay. To ask the Scottish Government when it will confirm whether there will be an inquiry into the policing of the 1984-85 minor strike in Scotland. <coughs> Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. As stated in my recent letter, the Scottish Government have been actively considering a way forward. During these considerations, a number of legal and procedural questions have emerged and we are steadily working through these. I am at an advanced stage in my consideration of this matter and I aim to confirm my decision shortly. Neil Findlay. It is ten months since uh, I and uh, union officials, former miners uh, and their legal representatives met with the Cabinet Secretary. The divisions uh, and scars of that time still run very deep in communities. So can I urge the Cabinet Secretary to, to reflect on all the evidence that has come out post Hillsborough and to do the right thing and to hold an inquiry into what I believe are historic miscarriages of justice. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, officer, when I met with the member and representatives from the uh, uh, mine workers uh, unions, I made it clear that I would consider the matters that they had raised with me, and that's what I've been doing over uh, recent months. And as I've uh, just stated, I will confirm uh, the government's decision on this matter in due course. James Dornan. Thank you, President Officer. As the main source of injustice towards the miners was the action of the then UK Government, and more importantly, neither the Scottish Government or any public inquiry in Scotland would have the powers to overturn convictions. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that it remains for the UK Government to carry out the inquiry, and the sooner the better? Cabinet Secretary. Also, the member is correct is that the source of injustice in relation to the policing of the minor strikes is a matter which relates to the actions of the uh, Conservative UK Government at that particular uh, point. However, I have always been very clear uh, that anything in relation to individual convictions relating to uh, the minor strikes uh, would be a matter for the Scottish Criminal Cases Review uh, Board here in uh, Scotland. I also wrote to the Home Secretary back in the 7th of November last year, making it very clear that the UK Government should commission and appoint an independent UK-wide investigation into any political interference during the course of the dispute. And as members will know, uh, that action has not been taken forward by the UK Government. Question number four, Tom Arthur. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer members to my register of interest in relation to music and my membership of the Musicians' Union to ask the Scottish Government how it supports the live music sector. Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop. The Government is committed to supporting live music in Scotland through the Youth Music Initiative, specific support for festivals and through our national performing companies. Over the last financial year, 2016-17, Creative Scotland awarded more than £12.8 million to music projects and organisations. This figure increases to an estimated £15 million when we take into account the many multi-art form venues and festivals across the country that include live music as part of their programmes. We have also confirmed £10 million towards a new concert venue for Edinburgh, which will reinforce the capital's reputation as a leading centre for music and the performing arts. And the British Irish Council, the creative industries work sector of that, is considering ways to best support live music venues and the flow of musicians into the UK music industry. The Council will report to ministers in November 2017. Tom I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, she will no doubt be aware of the concerns of key stakeholders such as the Musicians' Union regarding Brexit's potentially detrimental impact upon the live music sector. 
both for musicians from other EU countries performing in Scotland and for Scottish musicians performing in Europe. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with, agree with me that our live music sector would be best served by continued membership of the single market and, crucially, the continuation of freedom of movement? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, indeed I do. The single market and the freedom of movement are vital to many of our industries, uh, particularly the music industry. It's an estimated 10% uh, of the UK's industry's workforce were non-UK EU national. And clearly, uh, membership of the single market and indeed freedom of movement allows our artists, our, our musicians, to take their work to a market of 500 million people with minimal administrative barriers. So that freedom of movement is very, very important indeed. And I want to quote Lissardo Lombardia, director of the Festival Inter-Celtic de L'Orient where we had 220 Scottish performers uh, performing as a country of honour this summer. He said, the free circulation of culture and ideas, particularly for artists and works of art, has helped Scotland develop its strong reputation in arts, music and creativity and became a, a, country, a major country for European culture. And we want that to continue in the future. That's the value of the single market freedom movement to our musicians, not just here in Scotland, but across Europe. Question number five, Margaret Mitchell. Scottish Government, when it last met with NFU Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Last week. The Minister may, may be aware that rural crime was discussed by the Justice Committee's last session around table uh, discussion. Following this, the Solicitor General established a working group to review the issue, which led to the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service updating existing policy and guide guidelines on agricultural crime. Rural crime subsequently fell. However, since January this year, there has been a widely reported increase in sheep worrying and farm thefts. So can the Minister outline or the plans to tackle this, this issue? Well, this is a, a very serious and important issue, and as the member has indicated, it's taken extremely seriously by the law officers and by Michael Matheson. Uh, the theft of sheep in remote rural locations, often conducted under cover of darkness, is a quite shocking crime. And it's absolutely right that we take all steps possible to tackle it. And I would certainly urge anyone in rural Scotland who uh, sees any suspicious act of this nature to report immediately to the police. Of course, uh, the nature of the place of these, uh, these crimes is such that it is perhaps difficult to expect that there is likely to be uh, evidence uh, or, or, uh, readily available, and that makes the, the crime more despicable. The damage to farmers financially and emotional is considerable, and I'm certainly very happy to work with all members across this chamber to see what more, if anything, we can do to tackle this horrible crime. Uh, it's a very serious matter indeed for Scotland's farming community. June McAlpine. Uh, thank you. Over the weekend, NFU Scotland warned that post-Brexit moving from our existing share of European farming support to a Barnet share would, quote, effectively half the sum coming to Scotland and would be catastrophic for our farming and crofting sectors. Does the Scottish Government uh, share that concern with the loss estimated at £250 million a year? Fergus, you Yes, the member is, is correct that at the weekend, the senior farming representatives in Scotland did say that unless the funding is maintained, that the, uh, that, uh, the risk is that the, if a Barnet share were applied, this, and I quote the farmers' representatives, this would effectively have the sum coming to Scotland and would be, and I quote, catastrophic, catastrophic, say the farmers' leaders, for our farming and crofting sectors, with any loss up to £250 million. Uh, I met with Michael Gove on Monday and I sought written assurances uh, that the pre-Brexit referendum pledges that funding would be matched, uh, pledges made by Mr Gove and many of his pro-Brexiteer colleagues, it's time to deliver on these pledges. And yet 18 months after the referendum, we have still not got categoric assurances of this type. So I made it clear to Mr Gove uh, on a frank and workmanlike discussion on Monday that this categoric assurance must arrive without any further delay. Anything less is utterly unacceptable. Rhoda Grant. 
given the Scottish Government measures on tagging and the traceability of sheep, are they making these available to Police Scotland when they're trying to find those who are stealing sheep and how traceability in the food chain could be used to make sure that those sheep could not be sold on? Cabinet Secretary. I think Ms Grant raises a very sensible point and the underlying principle is that any evidence which is available which could help to bring to justice those who perpetrate these crimes uh, should be available to the police and the independent prosecution authorities. I will therefore uh, look into that specific matter with the law officers and report back to Ms Grant on the matter. Question number six, Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve mental health care provision for children and young adults with learning disabilities and autism. Minister Maureen Watt. A key section in the mental health strategy deals with the prevention and early intervention, and there are a range of actions in the strategy aimed at ensuring children and young people, including those with learning disability and or autism, have good mental health and that agencies act early enough when issues emerge and impact on young lives. In addition, the Scottish strategy for autumn, autism has developed a menu of interventions, including advice, therapeutic interventions, and counselling for children, young people, and adults with an autistic spectrum disorder. The menu helps to support professionals, people with autism, their parents, and carers to identify the advice and support available and set out the referral and assessment process for all other services and interventions. Annie Wells. Thank you. Scotland currently ha doesn't have any inpatient facilities providing specific psychi psychiatric care required for children or young people with learning disabilities or autism. A national working group was set up last year to look at developing proposals for learning disability inpatient facilities. And in the Mental Health Strategy for 2017 to 2027, the Scottish Government stated it would support work on the inpatient needs of these children. Can the Minister ascertain what stage this is at and when we can expect the findings? And can the Minister also give any detail of these findings, particularly in relation to the number of psychiatric inpatient beds recommended for children and young adults with learning disabilities and autism? Minister Maureen Wood. Uh, the Learning Disability and Autism Inpatient Unit is currently in the early planning stages and a report by the Short Life Working Group is due in March 2018. Health boards continue to provide learning disability CAM services to those that require them, including a range of specialist support in the community if inpatient services are required. There are a range of options available to boards, including admission to one of the three CAMS inpatient units in Scotland or, if necessary, admission to a specialist LD CAMS inpatient unit in England. Question number seven, Anasawa. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with the GP contract. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. We continue to negotiate a new GMS contract with the BMA's Scottish General Practitioners Committee. These talks are progressing well. We intend these commercially sensitive negotiations to conclude in 2017 to enable a new contract to be implemented from April 2018. And I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Royal College of General Practices tell us that the uh, GP practice has been cut by over £1 billion by this government. Uh, and they also report that we're on course to be 600 GPs short by 2021. We currently have one in three GP practices reporting a vacancy. This shows how crucial this GP contract process is. What process will there be not only for GPs to be engaged in the GP contract process, but also the wider health sector and all professions and stakeholders too? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Anna Sarwa will be aware, of course, of the commitment to uh, invest £500 million in primary care over the course of this Parliament, £250 million of which will go in direct support of general practice. And for 1718 uh, alone, £71.6 million investment uh, is going into general practice to address uh, many of, of the issues Anna Sarwa raises, particularly recruitment <laughs> and retention. In terms of the GMS contract, this is hugely important to set the direction of travel for general practice and primary care, a multidisciplinary model with uh, GPs at the heart as the, as the clinical uh, expert 
to, within that multidisciplinary team. Uh, in terms of the, the contract negotiation, as I said in my initial answer, it is uh, at a sensitive stage, but the wider issues around the multidisciplinary team are being discussed with a wide range of other health professionals and indeed uh, in, in public engagement to make sure the public understand the new multidisciplinary model and the range of health professionals and social care professionals that will support that. Thank you very much. That concludes topical questions. We turn now to First Minister's questions, but before we do, uh, members will wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery Ellen Jones AM, Clueth of the National Assembly for Wales. Thank you. Now, First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davis.